we're not that important. We are not that important. And I think that's another really good piece of advice for someone in sales who might be having that anxiety or not comfortable being uncomfortable yet. Like when you were picking up the phone to call somebody, a cold call, when you're knocking on a door, when you're having that first meeting, put the ego aside. You're not that important. <laughs> Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is an industry expert whose brain I am excited to pick. It's, it's good to sit down with you. He's a leader who enables teams to work at their best, and he combines his background in media planning, sales, and operations to drive innovation that closes deals. Not only is he a professional seller, but also an adjunct instructor for the Fox School of Business at Temple University, where he is today. So excited to talk to you in in office and uh, former VP of RevOps for a major telecommunications company, Kevin Koala. Kevin, great to have you here. Hey, thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Great to be here. Hey, well, I'm going to jump right into it. And it's a question we often start with. What is the one... B2B sales skill, that that soft skill, that human element of B2B sales that really creates an impact both in relationships and in revenue on that commercial relationship side, right? Oh, boy, boy the one skill. Um, you know, I don't know if this is the right answer or the one skill, but the thing that actually came to my mind when you said that um, without overthinking this was shutting up and listening. And I think that it's human nature in a sales experience or in a two-way conversation to want to talk, to want to, let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about me. Let me tell you about my business. Let me tell you about my product, why we're number one. And I think that the the key that I've found is to quiet those instincts and instead, you know, have two ears and one mouth kind of thing and let the other person talk. I think it's really good advice and it's it's common sense, right? When we all take yeah. ourselves out of the sales environment, you can say, ah, yeah, it's common sense. We need to listen. We need to understand. And, you know, we just finished a, a survey about 950 sellers and buyers. And, and it was interesting from the buyer side, the one thing they said that they want more than anything else. I want to be heard and I want to be understood. Yeah, I believe it. And, and it goes back to, I think, some of the words that when we were talking prior to this, you know, we had said empathy has has lost its meaning. Kind of everybody says, yeah, you need to show empathy. That came up big during everybody going remote and kind of during the pandemic as we we're working from home and, and crazy schedules. But I really hung on that where it said empathy has lost meaning. Explain kind of your take there and, and how that relates back to your definition of EQ. Yeah, well, first of all, Tim, I just want to say I see you and I hear you. <laughs> um. No, you're right. People people want to be seen, they want to be heard, and they want to know that they matter. I, I really think that's what sales, business, and just the human experience is in, in general. And thinking about the definition of emotional intelligence, I mean, it, it's a couple of different things. And it's your ability to have awareness of yourself and others, your ability to control uh, your emotions, your, to express your emotions, and to handle all of our interpersonal relationships thoughtfully and with care, and yes, with empathy. And, you know, you had said empathy has sort of lost some meaning. I think that's true. I This might just be me and my experience, but I feel like if, I don't know, rewind 10, 15 years, empathy was a newer word, a newer part of our, our social lexicon. And it caught steam, you know, I don't know whether it was via TED Talks or Brene Brown's rise or, or what it was, but it caught on. And it's, it's definitely different than sympathy. You know, sympathy is I feel bad for you, but empathy is I feel with you. And it's not, oh, yeah, yeah me too. I get it. It's really putting yourself in the other person's shoes. And 
when I say putting yourself in the other person's shoes, it's not, oh, what would I do in their situation? It's wearing their shoes. What would that person do in that situation? Or what is that person feeling? And how can I try and understand that? Or how can I best show up for or interact with that person who's having those feelings, emotions, and experiences? When, and you, as you said, well, EQ, empathy, it's been on the, uh, the TED Talk talk track. It's been the, the buzzword very often in, in management and leadership conversations. But putting it into action in a sales environment, in a commercial relationship is a lot harder said or oh, yeah. actually put into practice than to just say, right? How do you practically kind of put self-awareness into practice? How, how do you ingrain that and teach that skill? Well, you, you said part of the answer in your question. It is practice. It's a practice. I don't think anybody wakes up one day and says, I'm going to go out into the world and I'm going to be empathetic and I'm going to succeed. Uh, I think it's practice. And what I learned and what I still practice, and I'm certainly not a master of, is trying to find, this might sound weird, in your body where you're feeling emotions. You know, if you're having a conversation with a friend, a loved one, a client, coworker, whomever it is, and inevitably somebody says something and it causes a physical reaction in your body, and that could show up differently for different people. It could be sweaty armpits. It could be your heart racing. It could be that pit in your stomach or those butterflies in your stomach. So I think the more that we have the ability to recognize and, and feel those feelings and then pause and then catch ourselves, because I think um, I'm not a scientist and I'll mess this up, but you know, thinking about our, our lizard brains and our, our the prehistoric part of our brains that kept us around for survival are now still with us. But, you know, I, the cliche that I've heard a hundred times is, you know, our bodies don't know if we're being chased by a saber toothed tiger or if we're about to do some public speaking. But the point is, is that like your body always knows and we should trust our bodies. So when you're in the heat of the moment and when your lizard brain kicks in and when that part of our, of our, instincts and biology want to cloud our logical thinking brain and take over, I think what helps ground me is finding that in my body. And for me, it's it's like a pit in my stomach, and maybe lower chest, upper belly area here, but it's a it's a pit in my stomach that I always feel. And if I'm able to catch that and then take a deep breath and then sort of stop talking, or if the other person's speaking, stop the inner monologue <laughs> and listen, ground myself, find that anchor in my body and sort of reset. And it is a practice because I just said that in a way that, oh, it sounds easy. But the next time you're facing some sort of real or perceived threat and your body takes over and your mind shuts off and an instinct kicks in, uh, it's really difficult. Yeah, you bring up a really good point about how we've been programmed for, I mean, we, we talk a lot about, about AI and how now we can program all these things into an AI system, right, to understand emotion or understand the different modalities of conversation. But we as humans, like we've got neurons and, and electricity firing through us, right, and synapses, and mm -hmm. we've been programmed for this fight or flight response. But that fight sure, yeah. was was out there in the wild to protect us and save us. Now it's sitting in an office or sitting in in, in front of a Zoom screen, and and that fight or flight response is still firing in our bodies. Whether it's I had too much coffee to drink this morning and I'm talking a million miles an hour, or it's I'm nervous about this presentation, so I'm clicking, or I can't read the room and engage the responses of my audience because I'm not sitting in front of them. Yeah. There's a lot of stressors. I'm thinking of our, our listeners and I'm thinking of those that have to get out every day and every quarter and hit their number. There's a lot of stressors that trigger that fight or flight that, that I think we can all reflect and look back and say, wow, during that meeting or during that sales call or whenever it might've been, we were not self-aware. We, we kind of fogged out and yeah. then you get off the call and you go, oh, I hope that was good. Kind of like a public speaking, but I like that. Example. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really good example. Yeah. So 
or, or to use the example that you just used, a Zoom meeting, I'll be another buzzword of the past few years is I'll be vulnerable in, I thought I was going to be doing this in a different room. I have a, mm-hmm. I have a classroom on a higher floor with really cool windows and a nice view of, of City Hall in Philadelphia. And mentally, that's where I was prepared to have this conversation. And I didn't prep, I didn't rehearse. I just, I knew it was, it was going to be a good conversation. But that off, that room, my classroom is now under construction. My classroom is you was moved. I couldn't use it. And I find myself in an empty faculty office that I wasn't prepared to use. The lighting is bad. And I got all thrown off my game. And I started to feel it. I felt that, that pit in my stomach, the nerves kick in and, and I had to catch myself. I thought, I'm like, well, do I cancel? Do I reschedule? And now I'm all, I'm all flustered. Uh-huh. And, you know, I said, no, get yourself together, man. Take a deep breath. This is fine. I'm going to have a nice conversation with my pal, Tim. All good. Yeah. Well, you, you add a really good human element to that because when we talk about self-awareness, I think you just said something that I read in a book one time. I think it actually had to do with more Wim Hof and some of the woo-woo of, of breathing and those things. But you even talk about that. I took a deep breath and I kind of recentered. How do you create that wedge? Because we all face it. So I'm, I'm curious your professional yeah. tactics. And then how do you teach that in teams, right? And especially has that changed since things have gone remote. Is that a different feeling than when you're, you know, in the office, walking into the boardroom about to give that big pitch? Yeah, that's, I think, a big part of the awareness, part of empathy and emotional intelligence to be able to to look at someone else and to pick up on the little cues when they might be off their game, if their eyes start to go, or if they do start to talk a million miles an hour, or give them grace. We're all humans just trying to figure this out and survive every every single day. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, hey, you know, do you need a, do you need a minute? Do you need to take a beat? It seems like, you know, you're talking really quickly. Um, it's all good here. It's not life or death. You know, we have a couple hours till the deadline. What's going on? Oh, I like that. And I think you can change the demeanor, the tone of the conversation just by yeah. that, either lowering your voice or taking that second to pause and take a deep breath, all those kind of like little micro wedges that sometimes we, we aren't aware of, or we don't get because we're, we're zooming from one 30 minute meeting to the next, to the the next. Yeah. And I think humor helps. And I think grounding in just grounding in reality helps because another phrase that I always like to use is I worked in advertising for many years and no one dies in advertising, Like no one dies in advertising. Who, or or I would say, you know, are you a surgeon? Is is there a body on your table right now? Who's who's going to die? Like you're not a surgeon. If if you, <laughs> and apologies to any surgeons out there, no pressure. But if you're, you know, if you have someone's life on your table and that scalpel nicks something it shouldn't, yeah, let's be on edge. Let's have a pit in our stomach. Let's let's be ready because that's what those emotions and that energy has programmed our DNA and our biology for. So my scalpel scalpel doesn't nick a vital organ in advertising, in sales, in fill in the blank. Let's be real with ourselves here. Whatever business many of us listening are in is not life or death. So I I always like to throw that out there. Like nobody dies in advertising. Nobody dies in finance. Nobody dies in software, whatever the case is. That's true. And and I think it also de-escalates the conversation. Also, often we talk about sellers and one of the things that maybe erodes trust and, and deflates the conversation or deflates that interest in buying is you're pushing me. You're driving too hard. You're trying to force me to a decision and accelerate this decision, which I have empathy for every seller out there that you live in a quarterly system where you have to hit your numbers. But that's not a good experience necessarily for the other end where the buyer is. It's just really eroding trust. So in an environment where you want to position yourself as a trusted advisor, but you still have those commercial boundaries of I've got to hit quarterly numbers, what are some of the things in in your time as working in rev ops and working in operations and with sales teams, like how do you keep that balance? And how do you keep that balance across teams? It's hard because sometimes building trust and building relationships takes time. And maybe you don't have three meetings or three months. 
build a relationship with, with somebody because, you know, the end of the quarter is next week or whatever the case is. Um, and I do, I know from being on the other side of the selling experience on, on the buy side for many years, you can smell desperation and you can, you can smell sleaze and you know, when the person might not care about your best interest. So I, I think it's as best as you can set aside your own personal anxiety and panic about, you know, what my sales manager is going to grill me on when I get back or will I, or will I not hit this number? You, you might miss it. You might miss it this week or this month or this quarter, but establishing trust establishes the longer term relationship that you're building. It will prevent churn or downgrades in the future with that customer. It will increase likelihood of referrals. And we all know that it's way more expensive and time consuming to get new business than it is to hold on and retain and grow existing business. So I think tactically in the moment, a lot of the things we've been talking about, shut your mouth, ask questions, have a genuine interest in the buyer or the client or the decision makers uh, experience. What are they facing right now? What are the, what, what anxieties are they having? You know, how can I help you? They probably have some sort of goal that they're shy of meeting. How can, you know, how can I help you meet your goal? How can I help you, you know, deliver a great value or an outcome? Be of service, ask what you can do for them and genuinely care, genuinely try and understand, you know, what it is like back to our comments about being in their shoes, but not what you would do in their shoes, what they would do in their shoes. I like that. And I, I think, you know, there was a great framework that Richard Harris, I just had on the last episode, he shared with it. And he, he in his framework of kind of a, a discovery call, it was like kind of getting that permission and that right to ask more questions as he says it. But it was also this feeling of like, I was feeling heard and understood and felt like I could ask questions as the, as the buyer potentially. And it, it really took it as this is a discovery call. I'm not going to go forecast this as a late stage opportunity and get myself in a bad situation. Like it is what it is. This is where I'm at in the journey. I'm very transparent this is where I'm at. with with the buyer and, and very transparent with where they are because I think then it sets you up for the long term not being in that situation. It, it, and, and you come away with it. I always think you want the buyer to be leaving that call like, oh, no, wait, can you tell me more? And then you kind of hang up and go, we'll follow up next time so that they're excited to show up to that next call. Because, you know, one of the biggest things I see as a challenge in, in revenue teams today is if I get that first meeting, I worked so hard to get that first meeting. And then so many opportunities or so many leads don't go from that first meeting to the second or third meeting, because whatever that experience was in that first meeting, it almost pushed someone off. That's right. That's right. Yeah, Kevin, what are some of the challenges you're seeing facing revenue teams today? Yeah, I think like many answers, it it's it depends. I mean, that depends on the industry. Are you are you growing? Are you a, a new and growing company within an increasing business? Are you a disruptor? Are you displacing something, you know, or are you at the late stage mat mature or declining? declining stage. Um, when you asked that question, the first thing that came into my mind was um, technology and also like the things that we're talking about here. Because I think there's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. When I say that, what I mean is automation and technology and putting control and power in consumers and buyers' hands is, is definitely taking over in a lot of different industries. And I referenced, I was in advertising and we know one of the trends in the past couple of years has been programmatic advertising where a lot of buying and selling has been done based on machines. There are certain parameters that are input. And if the parameters match, the deal goes through and the role of a seller changes. There are less sellers needed and they're, you know, to be dramatic and for storytelling purposes being replaced by machines. Uh, so I think that that's one challenge. And depending on who you are and your skill set and your interest, that might be very exciting for you because that sale changes. So instead of a human to human sale, you are still a human interacting with another human, but configuring and automating the process. But if you are not someone who is good with change or comfortable with change, or you like things the way they've been, 
I think, you know, when many industries are, are facing and, and seeing this today. Um, now, the flip side of that, I think that with social media, with so much of our business going, e going to email and social media and, you know, social prospecting, um, and I, I teach a class with, under, with undergrads, and it just you just, you have to think about the the soft skills of what we're talking about today. Can you hold presence? Can you hold eye contact? Can you sit with someone across a table, or a desk, or or a lunch meeting, and connect with somebody? I mean, I have teenagers, and I, I teach underclassmen, and I'm seeing, you know, a change in in that. And I know that this is kind of a overdone topic, but. It's something that I really try and work on with my students and with my kids, you know, put the phone down, put the screen down, connect with somebody eye to eye. And so that was a very long winded kind of double answer there for you. I, I like that, though. I like the second part, because here's what I'm going to double click on. Yes, it's talked about often, but that doesn't mean that it's solved and it doesn't mean that it's not a massive problem. Right now, I see across every generation, doesn't matter who I'm selling to, I see less and less people wanting to talk to sales. Like you just said, mm -hmm. it's getting automated or people are looking for alternative ways and putting the seller later or further back in the sales process because they have to still talk to somebody. But that's an interesting phenomenon. And it, it does, it brings its own bag of challenges. But the one I want to click into is getting attention. You talked about, okay, the soft skills are what keep and, and create attention. But how are you hearing from either your college students in terms of how they think they can break through the noise as they move into careers in sales and in professional roles, or how are you seeing companies break through all that noise? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because social selling is important. It's necessary. It's amazing for all the reasons that we know it's amazing. So I'm not downplaying or, or going to talk anything negative about that. So keep that in mind. But I think that a critical and key piece is still a very human aspect of prospecting, business development, knocking on doors, and picking up the phone. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a scary thing that a lot of people uh, are having a hard time getting comfortable with. I do like some role playing in in my class and in my previous roles. I oversaw like sales enablement and training teams, and just reminding and reinforcing people that you can pick up and call somebody. Mm -hmm. And there is a high likelihood that they'll actually answer the phone. And then what? And so then getting what? people, yeah. uh -huh. and then what? So a, a, a phrase I use often, and, you know, getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Like, uh -huh. this is the hard part about sales that makes, you know, puts the butterflies in your stomach and makes your palms sweat. Um, but like we talked about earlier, it's practice. And the more you do something, the more comfortable you, you know, that you'll get at it. So I think a great way to break through clutter is to go old school and continue to call, continue to knock on doors, continue to network and see who you can get in front of. But I think the contrarian view I have, and I, I now take a different view, is you, you just changed my mind. I felt like the phone, and a lot of sellers are going to cringe when I say this, I thought like the phone was dead because of my own buying behaviors. Like I did not mm. want to talk to somebody. The phone was like extremely permission-based for me, meaning like if I talked to you, I got to know you, then I'd definitely pick up a phone call. I'll definitely text you back immediately. I tell people to text me all the time that I meet at conferences or whoever, right? Like that's, but it's a very permission-based and permission, if it's cold, right. it's like, yeah, not even touching it. Please just get out of my inbox. Cold text message, even worse. Like you're on my blacklist at that point, right? But I flip that around and I think, okay, I'm building up a sales team and I want them to be more self-aware. That exercise of getting on the phone and understanding how to put, going full circle to our conversation, how to put the wedge in between how they're feeling and that flight or fight response and what they're practicing every day, you just gave like, that is the most tactical yeah. way to get somebody to learn how to deal with this stuff. What is the scariest thought as a new or young seller? Yeah. There's a list and a phone. Like that's, <laughs> that's horrifying. Yeah. But here's a, here's a list of email addresses and people you need to look, you know, look up in LinkedIn sales navigator. Oh, okay. I'll do that all day. Um, actually 
I wish I was more prepared for this. I would have looked up the the content that I presented in my class, but we had a whole we had a whole section on this of the phone and the phone is not dead. And mm-hmm. let's get back to the phone. And you know, if you want to read more about this, uh, the Jeb Blount fanatical prospect thing, he talks a lot about this kind of concept. And because for all the reasons we're talking about that the phone might feel dead right now and the permission based only, and oh my gosh, who talks on the phone anymore? And you know, mm-hmm. who leaves a, even worse, a voicemail? Um, I think it's because, I don't know about you, but when my phone rings, I'm like, oh, wow, my phone's ringing. Who is it? And I actually find myself picking up lately. Um, it disrupts in a, in a time where I almost feel like email and even at least LinkedIn is becoming so noisy that I don't even look, right? I never even open it. Like that is true. At least I look at the phone number. If somebody sneaks through, maybe I'll answer it or, or maybe I'm interested because, ooh, is there something coming from that area? But yeah, it's, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting thing to look at what channels are, are winning and what channels are maybe getting, getting too noisy or too polluted. And that is changing. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the old uh, what's old is new again kind of thing of, um, you know, the golden hours and the call, you know, call in the morning before nine o'clock, call after, you know, four o'clock, call on uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays because, you know, Monday's catch up day and Friday is getting ready for the weekend. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, you know, number of calls, like how many times you, you call. I, I have a, a recent experience where uh, Someone in, software, someone in software sales was reaching out to me, try to sell something and it was just email. And the, where I'm going with this is persistence. Yeah. Um, and the person had emailed and I was on vacation, emailed again, I was busy. I saw them, but, you know, moving on. Oh, and I thought, oh, that actually sounds interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll reply back. And then they emailed again. And I, I, I'm like, oh man, like I, I totally meant to get back to this person. And I looked and I opened the email and it was, well, this is my fourth time trying to get in touch with you. So I guess I'll, I guess I'll leave you alone now. Uh huh. And I thought, well, you just lost the opportunity for a meeting because I was actually going to reply, you know, let's meet. But the, t- the tone in there was actually worse than that. The point is, is just, you know, frequency and repetition. And it might take four or five, six, seven, eight touches before you get that bite and don't make assumptions that you are annoying the other person. I think that's human nature. Like, Oh man, I reached out to them five times and they didn't get back to me. Well, again, tying it back to the concept of empathy. What if they're at a funeral? What if they're on their honeymoon? What if they're in the middle of their biggest planning season, which I suppose if you're knowledgeable about the industry, you should know that, but you know, always making, you know, assuming positive intent that, you know, it was that that salesperson's immediate response was, "Oh, well, I guess you know I bothered you enough, and you're not going to get back to me." No, I was busy. So make the assumption of positive intent, and that they are busy. And until or unless you get a nasty phone call or email back, keep trying. Well, that's a good mindset change, and I think there's two things in that that I observe. Is one. The breakup email, which a lot of people have said this, I've seen a lot of them, a lot of it posted lately, like the don't do the breakup email. So everybody, there's another one. Take the breakout breakup emails out of your sequences because yeah. it closes the conversation. It closes and, it. Yes. And often for me, it's like it's not if, it's when, right? And so if you if you break up with me, it's like, well, no, then there's no, there was no um when, it's just not gonna happen. But most of the time on the other ones, it's like, oh, yeah, that'd be interesting. Like you said, kind of interesting tech, kind of interesting solution or something that might fit. You might have found a business case for me, but it's just not the right time. I got other things going that are more pressing. I hate yep. to say that because sellers, of course, that doesn't help me in my quarter close, but it definitely yeah. you know, it goes back to kind of nurturing and, and adding value. One fact that we recently uh, were talking about at uh, the AISP conference was you know, buyers actually value four times more business understanding. So understanding mm-hmm. their business and understanding their industry and those things, then they do product knowledge. Agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Ag- agree completely. Yes. If that's the case, and here's my, this is what excites me for the future, because I think we now have the stats to prove this. How do we in the future better empower 
the sales teams that are coming out of your university and all across the country. I give a shout out to Florida State, many others that are in these professional sales programs. How do we teach enablement and operations teams and they get out of college to coach on those skills more than to coach on product knowledge? Well, I think it's just that. I think I think it's what, we're, what you're talking about is selling people. You're, you're selling them on changing their mind. So what are some of the change management you know, techniques that you can do? I mean, we think about, oh, what's the WIFM? What's the ROI? Well, mm-hmm. here's empirical data that references and shows that I, I believe you said four times you know, higher. And I forget what the other stat is, but there's something, oh, I think it was from like the challenger sale where they had broken up, you know, what are some of the drivers of a positive sales experience? And I'm, I'm, I forget what the percent was, but you're right. Product knowledge was very low. Mm-hmm. And I think because that's, that's to some extent a given, like if you have a really good website or, or product kit or capabilities deck or whatever it is that you have, um, and ideally good word of mouth and referrals and others experiences with it, that should just be table stakes. So mm-hmm. yeah, of course I, I have answers about the product, but like what we talked about earlier is, you know, don't go in any kind of meeting and saying we're number one at this and we can do this and here's our new widget and this is us, 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 me, 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 me. Cause that's essentially what it is. I, I translate your comment about product knowledge into I'm going to talk at you. I'm going to tell you about me. When the whole point here and everything that we talked about is emotional intelligence and empathy and making the other person, their business needs, their desired business outcomes, the priority and the primary point. And then, yeah, go back and put together a great and compelling capabilities, capability or, you know, presentation of, hey, I heard, you know, from the discovery, hey, I heard you, here's how we can meet your needs kind of thing. But yeah, for sure, a positive I don't remember what the percent was for product knowledge, but I do remember that it was 53% was the driver of trust and having a positive experience with the salesperson who I believe has genuine interest in me and knowledge in my industry. Because that's what that's what a buyer wants. They, they don't want to come in and say, hey, what keeps you up at night? Tell me about, you know, oh, well, I can tell you it keeps me up at night all day long, but... I know me, I know my business, but in your role, you interact with dozens of my peers and my competitors. What are you hearing? What are you experiencing out in the market that you can teach that you can teach me about my own industry or help me to see something I'm blind to? I, lo- I love the the saying of help me teach me to see something I'm blind to, right? Because now you're coming in and you're actually saying like, okay, focus on the user, not on the product. Focus mm-hmm. on I know I've made these observations in the industry, meaning I know your industry. Do you have those? You're validating and you're kind of understanding that, yep, you're in the same place. I know that tennis players get tennis elbow or whatever it might be. You know, you're feeling this pain in your elbow. Okay. Yep. Then we, then you go through that kind of story as focusing on the user, focusing on solution rather than focusing on, well, do you want to buy these widgets? Do you want to buy these these features and capabilities? I love how you, how you frame that idea of that switching the, the lens and switch the it. And, and switch, switch it. Like, yeah. Like the widget thing. Okay. Here at this stage, this widget, it does this and that and the other thing, but instead you can say, oh man, right. Okay. So right here with this widget for client X, when we enabled that, they saw, you know, Y percent increase of revenue and X percent decrease in hours spent performing this task. Yeah, this is what it now felt like for that person to do their job compared to what it was before. I think Andy Resnick talks about it often as like the old game versus the new game and kind of showing that that change of like, here's what it used to be and here's how it is today. Yeah. And that new reality. So I'm going to flip the lens a little bit on you. We've been learning from you for the last uh, about 30 minutes or so. And and so would love to learn a bit more about you. So kind of take us back to what got you here and uh, kind of where where your road has gone in sales and, and your profession over the years. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because because I, I I never would have believed you if you were a time traveler and you went back 25 years and told me that I would have an MBA and would would have worked for corporate America and that I'd be teaching in a business school. Um, Those those were never what I had imagined. I I thought I was going to be an artist. 
uh, a writer. Um, there was a moment in time where I wanted to make animatronic dinosaurs for like Jurassic Park and, and theme parks and everything but what I do now. Um, twist of events found me living in New York City and um, having lunch with a friend of my family who worked at some ad agency somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. So we had lunch. She ended up being uh, global SVP of the number one original first ad agency on Madison Avenue. So wow. when you say Madison Avenue, you're referring to this agency. And I was fortunate enough to, you know, have an interview set up and get the job. And, you know, one opportunity turned into another. And uh, I didn't come from uh, the highest financial means. And just for the first time, feeling like, oh, wow, I'm living in New York City and I have money and more money and more money. And, you know, I learned this cool new thing and I met this great person and, uh, you know, blinked and, and years go by. So I worked for my first 10 years in, in on Madison Avenue doing a mix of account management, business development, media research, media planning, media buying. And then as often people do around 10 years on the agency side, you you flip either to the client side or the sell side. And I went sell side. And had an extraordinary experience uh, leading sales teams, leading sales development, uh, and then pivoting into some product and product sales and product sales support and more like the SaaS platform. And then most recently having kind of a hybrid, hybrid experience where I supported a large sales organization in terms of both sales strategy and sales enablement, sales effectiveness, and also um, uh, software sales. So it was fun. It was a good experience. And then I got my MBA along the way, um, had an opportunity to teach and taught a class, was asked to come back and teach it again and teaching another class. So, yeah. That's awesome. And, you know, college was an amazing experience for me. Some of my great mentors have come from those those college professors in those times. Um, so, so there's a soft part there. What about Temple University and, and the teaching profession got you so excited? So referring to, you know, what I wanted to be when I grew up, teaching was always an option. And okay. throughout my career, I had good fortune of always having some component of training as part of my formal, my, my formal uh, job responsibilities, mm -hmm. um, whether it was product training, product marketing, the sales enablement, you know, one of my last teams, I had a team of uh, 13 skill develop, we call them skill development managers, and they did sales training and product training. So I just love teaching and training and, you know, all the Myers-Briggs and what Harry Potter house and all I've done all the tests of uh -huh. your personality and all mine are all like teacher and mentor and coach. So it's, it's, it's just in me, it's just something I really love to do. And one of the reasons, if not the number one reason why I got an MBA was to have the academic, you know, credentials, or maybe in my opinion, or my feeling permission to get to teach someday. So met somebody who knew somebody who was an amazing advocate and networker and got a meeting and was offered my first class and loved it, loved it, loved it. It is honestly the most rewarding and fun professional or academic endeavor I've ever taken. Incredible. And giving back a ton every single semester after semester, shaping uh, the next generation of business professionals. Yeah, it, it, there's there's nothing cooler than when a student in the class is stuck on something or doesn't understand, and then you can see it click. Or they hang out after class and say, hey, I, I have an interview tomorrow, and I'm a little nervous and I'm not quite sure and, you know, do a little interview role playing. And then a couple of days later, you know, professor, professor, I got the job. Like, it's just, you know, talking about in business often, you know, we're not saving lives and it's fun. Sales is fun. Business is fun. Awesome. But having to see that direct impact on another person is just, there's nothing better. Now, when you go back in time and you think, okay, graduating college, if you had to give yourself some advice or, or something kind of, you know, looking back, what advice would you give yourself retrospective as you graduate? Oh, college? yeah, so, for sure. In this episode, I'm sure. Yeah, you're, you're not that important. And, 
<laughs> I would tell myself you're you're yeah. you're not that important, and um, a lot of the things that you really believed mattered don't matter. And just to take it easy on yourself, I uh, still am to some extent getting better, but I was very 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 hard on myself, overthought everything, hyper self critical. How did that sound? How did I do that? That sounded stupid. That oh, I did a bad job. You know. I would just tell myself to take it way easier on myself. Great advice for every single person listening, whether it's the last Zoom meeting you had that didn't go great or whatever it might have been. Again, I loved your line, you know, in sales and marketing and a lot of these go-to-market efforts, we don't have somebody in front of us. We're not saving lives. Mm -hmm. so no one's going to die. And I think that's a good yeah. way to put it in the context that you'll have yeah. another you'll have another opportunity you'll have another account to sell to yes it all matters but put it in perspective mm -hmm. so i think that goes back to what you said being able to control and really gauge and put into perspective where you're at where the buyer is on the other end and be a little more self-aware yep. yeah a, a lot of gems coming out of this episode and uh you know, a, a great reflection for all of us as, you know, going into for us, a new fiscal um, for many um, or a new quarter coming up soon and, uh, and, a, and a busy year in front of us, but increase that self-awareness and uh, build a little bit better connection with our prospects. So thank you. For there you go. Us. There you go. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Awesome. And, and Kevin, where can people find you? Where can they connect? What's the best way? Oh, I'm, I'm big on Instagram personally. So KP Kowalik and just on LinkedIn for any business purposes. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Really enjoyed having you on today. To all of our guests, thank you so much for tuning in. And until the next time, uh, we will see you back here or wherever you get your podcasts on B2B EQ. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.